You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Welcome to Smart Sex, Smart Love, where talking about sex goes beyond the taboos and talking about love goes beyond the honeymoon. I'm Dr. Joe Court. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back, everyone, to my current listeners, and hello to all my new listeners this week. This week, we're going to be talking about reparative therapy, sexual conversion attempts. This week, I'll be looking into the controversial world of reparative therapy, which is sexual conversion attempts to turn people from gay to straight. My guest is Larry Jameson, a writer, educator, and activist who has spent 10 years exploring ex-gay ministry and reparative therapy. He wrote a book about his experience called Discoveries in the Closet, A Young Man's Struggle with Faith and Sexuality. Larry wants people to understand why someone might choose to do sexual conversion therapy and that it's not about crazy people, but very vulnerable people trying to get help. Welcome, Larry. Hey, Joe. Good to be here. Really good to have you here. You know, my early work spent a lot of time and attention on reparative therapy, even though I was not a a product of it. I was never drawn to it. My my uh, focus was on the lies in the reparative therapy that uh, I would read all the books, all the materials. I was obsessed with it because of all the gaslighting mm-hmm. at the time of saying, well, we're not anti-gay. And then uh, you would get into the book within pages or a chapter. It would say there's nothing gay about being homosexual. So I'm so glad <laughs> to help you help us, you know, think this through. Yeah, it's a really complex a topic and I'm glad that you know you're um wanting to have this on your show today. So let me start with my first question and my it my first question here says why did you choose reparative therapy is that a choice you made to study it or to be in it or both? Um uh both but mostly to be in it um I was you know by the time I found reparative therapy I was already seeking answers because you know, society and and religion had already geared me towards um, being afraid to identify myself as gay. Um, And so I was looking for an answer because I, I, unlike, you know, a lot of people that end up in these kind of things, I did not want to be gay because I was afraid of what that meant. um, And I already had a disdain for it. Um, And reparative therapy basically uh, spoke to my core wounds. I was pretty much a poster boy for what they said um, would be the core wound of a homosexual. What's that? And yeah, so they, they attribute, you know, they attribute to your core wounds a disease, which they call homosexuality or unwanted same sex attraction. Which is also known as USSA, right? Yes. Yeah. And when you say core wounds, do you mind what what do they mean? What are the core wounds? The core wounds that they essentially focus on is uh, uh, difficulty with the relationship with your father. Um, I mean, and, and even Carl Jung's work, uh, he talks about you know father son wound. Um, so a lot of guys have that. Um, also peer rejection, any kind of trauma or abuse, usually sexual abuse. Um, and sometimes you might be a mama's boy, which I was. So, um, those were the, those are the big ones. There's other ones, but those are the biggest. And they would say that those. And I, and I had all of them. <laughs> yeah, right. And I do too, actually. I was sexually abused. I had a bad, well, my father had a bad relationship with me and I was a mama's boy, all those things. So they would say uh, that when you're that profile, you are um, uh, potentially able to, that made you gay, really. Isn't that what they said? Yeah, yeah. They take the, the, part of a young man's life where, uh, you know, you're admiring men and you might admire men so much that you sexualize them. And from my experience with young, young kids and myself, there does come that point where you're, you're confused. And they say, because of these core wounds, you never transition out of that phase. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And, and that's what makes you gay. It's also very old fashioned psychoanalytic treatment and psychodynamic treatment and therapy. They would say, you know, that if you, your, your adolescence was your second chance to come out of any kind of homosexual interest. And if you didn't, mm-hmm. then you uh, were stuck in your adolescence. I mean, there was so much pathologizing. And I'm sorry that happened to you that, that you uh, found it as something that could be helpful to you, but it wasn't, right? Yeah, exactly right. Um, and, and that's, uh, people don't understand it's a really loaded weight to have on you. Um, you know, to have that on top of, you know, any trauma you've been through, um, to say, okay, well, you know, that's terrible that you've had that trauma. Now you also have this disease homosexuality. So let's try. And get rid of that too. So in other words, never really happens. Right. It doesn't work. There's lots of research that show, uh, over and over and over again, it doesn't work. Um, but you're saying basically, so we're sorry that trauma happened to you, but we're going to further trauma you, traumatize you. But, yeah. Right. But they don't know they're doing it. They, I really don't believe the people that are doing this. I think they believe what they believe, don't you? Or do you think they're doing it intentionally? Um, I think for the most part, I agree with you. I, their intention is to fix you. And, um, you know, uh, some of it is hate, but it's, it's more covert. Like they don't even realize it. Um, I found a lot of the leaders would keep a certain painful distance from me as if I had, a disease that they didn't want to catch. That's awful. Like I remember one, one guy um, I had written to cause he had an article in the paper that he was leaving homosexuality and we got together and I was at his church and I would say about the second or third church visit, he had to stop contact with me and leave the church because I was a temptation to him, you know? So it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's but so, um, yeah, I agree with you. It's not necessarily an overt, we hate you kind of thing. No. And you know, Joseph Nicolosi Sr., who is now deceased, um, wrote mm-hmm. all those books on healing homosexuality, uh, reparative therapy. And then he, he started right. realizing that they were coming after him. So he wrote a book called Preventing Homosexuality so that people couldn't mm-hmm. say he was trying to change anyone. He was just trying to prevent someone. And so then he died and his son now, same name, yes. kind of, I was like, how can there be a new article by Joseph Nicolosi? Um, you know, and then it was his son and he's basically come out right. saying, well, my dad was really, really the, in the forefront of talking about sexual fluidity. Bullshit. Yeah. God damn oh it. Such God. a goddamn bullshit lie. I'm sorry. Your dad was an no. anti-gay, homo-negative um, bigot, and he didn't give anybody a chance um, to allow for anything other than heterosexuality. Would you agree? <laughs> oh, oh, exactly. And just so you know, I'm, I don't know if you're aware of this, but his organization that he ran, which is the, was the National Association for Reparative Therapy, um, called NARS, has reformed since he died uh, under something called the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and scientific integrity. I do know that. And keep okay, going. Good. Yeah, but keep going. They don't know that. Yeah, yeah. And um a lot of that's what happens with a lot of these organizations like Exodus International. Mm-hmm. That was a big one that closed, but now um there's Restorative Hope Network um and Exodus Global, which originally wasn't really all that um, hardline on converting people, but now that Exodus closed, it has, you know, went kind of gangbuster. So that's what happens. These places close and people are cheering and thinking it's over and it pops up in other little places where people regroup and yes. reform it. Now, sometimes it closes because people realize this is bullshit for me. I'm gay and I'm coming mm-hmm. out. And then other times leaders fall in love with each other and they realize, no, yeah. I feel good. Right. That happened with Exodus, didn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The founders, uh, Michael Busey and Gary Cooper um, ended up getting married and then, um, later, years later, they formed what was called XX Gays. Yes. Which is, a, yeah. And no, no, still run that as. Say what that is. I'm, I want yeah. you to say it. You know what it is. Yeah. XX Gay is just people who have 
come out against being ex-gay. Um, <laughs> it gets complicated with these terms, but um, it's largely on Facebook. It's a, it's a Facebook group, and um, there is a gay Christian convention that happens that a lot of ex ex gays go to. But you know, too, Joe, there's there's really an important difference too between ex-gay and reparative therapy, even though they borrow from each other. So you might not have a lot of people that are in reparative therapy next necessarily in the ex-gay movement. Mm. Um, so they, they, you know, I, I did a timeline, two timelines on my website, gotwords.org. And one is a timeline of the history of ex-gay ministry and another is a timeline of reparative therapy. Um, so they borrow from each other, but they're they're different. Yeah, it's really the first time I started seeing somebody attack the ex gay therapy movement was um, uh, Wayne Besson. He wrote this book. If you know the yes. book, yeah, anything but straight. And on the cover mm -hmm. was an, a guy, John Polk, who had uh, been mm -hmm. seen in a gay bar, and they called Wayne Besson because he was sort of the the guy who was like on top of all this. And they said, "Come on mm -hmm. down and bring your camera. He's here, and he's saying he's ex-gay, but he's he's in a gay bar flirting with guys." And he did, and he and and John yeah. Polk saw him, and then started fleeing the gay bar. And John and Wayne Besson took pictures of him. So on the cover of the book mm -hmm. is Wayne Besson running, ears back, hair flying <laughs> back, <laughs> not wanting to be. <laughs> Well, in the picture, and it was the cover. I remember being on a plane. My shoulders were jumping up and down. I was laughing so hard because it's so – you know, and it's really, it's not funny. I don't mean to make light of it, but what's funny is it's so yeah. incredibly stupid and, um, yeah. and, and it's, you know, sexist and, and biased. And right. so obviously, yeah. but people who are troubled and vulnerable, like you say, they have so much don't want to be gay because of their religion, their relationships, whatever. They're, they buy yeah. into it. Right. And, you know, there's so much, there's so much disdain for, and, and scare, being scared of the medical community, um, even in society and especially in religion, to doubt it. I remember when I heard about the APA um, saying that homosexuality was no longer going to be considered a mental illness. And, you know, by then I remember my reaction was, well, what does the APA know? Because I had already been indoctrinated by society to doubt you know, medicine and especially my religion, which said Jesus is the great physician, so only depend on him. And America to me worships the Bible more than they worship God. I'm still a spiritual. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Person, that was good. But, America worships the Bible more than they worship God. That's profound. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. They t you know, it's like the King James just plopped right out of heaven and let's just take this literally and out of context and just read it and I worship that and you know that's what gets us into trouble. Oh my gosh. But you know, you think about it, Joe, I mean I'm into natural health stuff and even in that area, you know, you have people that, you know, don't get your kids vaccinated, um, don't trust the medical community. So when they come out with this stuff, we can all revert back to all this, you know, bias and bigotry and you know, snake oil salesmen. And that's what I kind of consider reparative therapy and ex-gay ministry. It's like, you know, here, follow these steps and, you know, plaster scriptures on your wall like I used to do yep. and get this indoctrinated in your head and then you will become straight. When and I was, it doesn't happen. When I first got into practice, and in, um, uh, well, I mean, I've been doing it almost thirty-five years, but private practice in '93, specialized with gay men. And I remember this older gay man at the time. He was my age now, but at the time, I was like thirty, and he was in his fifties. And he said that um, the day he had been in psychoanalytic treatment to change his sexual orientation three times a week for many, many years. And one day his therapist came in and said, I want to apologize to you. I don't believe in this anymore. You're, you're gay as being okay. And I'm sorry for all this. And my, my client looked yeah. up, got out of the, the couch and said, go fuck yourself. You ruined all these years of my life. You took all my money. And that, and I wow. ended up having to help him recover from the, the trauma that the therapy did itself. Uh, so my question to you uh, would be, what do you think are the dangers of reparative therapy? What does it do to someone? Yeah, well, you know, 
back in the olden days, they used, you know, electric shock, um, really physical stuff. But with reparative therapy, since that, it, that's still done today, but not as much. And when you have reparative therapy and conversion therapy, the focus is more emotional and mental exploitation. Mm -hmm. So again, like we talked about earlier, um, adding more to your trauma because now you have this disease, um, which is uh, USSA or homosexuality. And, you know, it takes years. I, I still struggle with it. And, you know, for some people, it leads to suicide. I used to, Joe, I used to have in my 20s, my 20s were torture. I had several mental breakdowns and I didn't have anybody to turn to but religion. So, you know, I pretended I had the flu. I would be out of work like with this really bad flu for almost a month. But it was really a mental breakdown mm. because I couldn't do anything with my sexuality. And, you know, or my pants rubbed me the wrong way. And, oh, my God, you know, what am I going to do? I'm so horny and this is so bad. And, you know, it's just it's, it's a mess and people kill themselves over it. Right. So, so the as much as the, the good intentions are of people that facilitate it. And also the the idea of that we you know somebody wants to be godly, and they think this is a way to do it, it, it leads to a really terrible, terrible crisis. Right of suicidality, depression, and really putting you mm -hmm. at war with your sexual identity. Right, there's nothing good about going yeah. to war with your sexuality. Right, I always quote I <clears throat> Jack Moran used to have this great quote: "If you go to war with your sexuality, you'll lose and cause more chaos and problems than you started." And that's what it sounds like for this. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, definitely. Would you say yeah. that there's any benefits to being in reparative therapy, trying to change yourself from gay to straight? You know, it's interesting. It, that's it's it's a tough question. I know some people might revolt at what I'm about to say, but just listen all the way through. Um, reparative therapy. The people that were involved and bar borrowed a lot of tactics of their processes from the men's movement, which I was also a part of, called the Mankind Project, as an example of that. Um, those processes, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, in the public, with the media taking, uh, you know, doing um, exposés on reparative therapy and the processes they use, they take those very good processes out of context. And um, you don't see the benefit, you just see the crazy because it looks crazy. Yes. But they use things like psychodrama or um, uh, embracing somebody or, or somebody. Uh, being represented by beating a pillow. It, it's, it's out of context, but those processes have been used for years and years in other settings. And there is some benefit, um, but for reparative therapy, it, it comes as a false miracle because any kind of emotional catharsis that you have um, comes with more baggage because you don't become straight from right, it. Right, right. And I'll give an example really quick. Um, the father-son wound that I talked about earlier is something a lot of men have, uh, just a, you know, a hard relationship with your dad. And, and that is what I had. And, um, you know, that's what they focused on. Hey, you have a, you have a bad relationship with your dad. Um, and that compelled me to what? To try and heal my relationship with my dad. Yes. Now was that was that a bad effect? Was that a be, was that not a benefit that I tried to heal my relationship with my dad? Of course, it was a benefit. Totally. Um, but when it didn't do anything for my sexuality, then I'm like, oh God. Well, what else do I do then? You know, and you know what you end up doing with all these little minor, these other benefits that you get from it. You're like, you start, you, you try and falsely believe that this is helping you in some way. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it just hasn't taken hold yet, but it eventually will. And this is what sends people into getting married because, well, maybe it'll end up working out because I've had all these other benefits. Right. And then it doesn't. And, it, and you know, you've just ruined somebody else's life and your own. I really like what you're saying. And let's, let's, let's spotlight it for a minute that 
um, the fact that it does help you heal your relationship with your father. It is um, – its intent is to help you with your own masculinity. But you're right. I love mm-hmm. what you said. The false miracle is that you're not going to – that yeah. is none of that is going to change your sexual orientation. And that promise no. uh, is so horrible because then you're left further devastated. I've done all this and I'm still gay. There must be something wrong with me. Yeah, it's it's so heavy, especially when you've had trauma. I've had um, sexual abuse and stuff like that, and and really bullied very severely for being for being gay like, and and um, you know it ended up being like PTSD. Mm-hmm. And to have this thing about me not being masculine enough and not straight enough yeah. on top of it, yeah. Yeah, the whole the, – and it's hard to believe this still goes on because gender is exploding now, right? What what anyone thinks gender is or should be or sexual yeah. orientation is or should be. I used to um, – I mean – and we're talking about this from male perspectives because it does target males more and males – because I always say this. Women, when they have a non-heterosexual thought, they're fetishized. And when a man has a non-heterosexual thought, he's he's stigmatized. So we run to yeah. get this – you know, it's horrible. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. What else would you want to say? We have a few more minutes. What else would be another really important point you want listeners to get out of conversion therapy? Well, you know, if if I had just a few minutes, what I would want to speak to is people that are seeking and they might be looking at reparative therapy right now. And um, I, you know, in my book and talking now, I don't want to put people up that are like, you know, I don't want to come across as like, this is just terrible and just believe me because it's terrible. Right, right. You know, good. that does nothing. <laughs> right. I would say do your research, talk to others, read, there's books on it. And you know what? Talk it to people on both sides. And, you know, I just want people to know that I wasted about 15 years of my life mm. because I was wounded enough to just go ahead and believe these people. Mm-hmm. Um, you have places now which, weren't there when I was younger or you, um, you have LGBT centers like affirmations in Ferndale and they're all over the country and you can go there and talk to people or there's groups. Um, so, you know, I recommend that, um, no LGBT history before you judge, because it's very easy to say, well, gays and stuff. Yeah. They just go to the bars and they're just, having sex and all these wild times. So of course it's bad. Yes. Well, you don't know what, what we, they've been kicked out of churches. They're kicked out of their homes. They haven't had places to go. Now that's changing. We're having a lot more other places to go and healthier things to do. So people are um, able to do that. And there's better role models than we've had. Um, But just don't, People want set answers. And as you know, Joe, and all your shows to me really emphasize this is that sexuality is so complex and it's fluid. Yes. There are no set answers. Yep. So don't just sit down with your pastor or don't just believe parents or people that haven't walked through this research, do your research. That's what I would say. I love it. I really agree with you 100%. Um, so your book is Discoveries in the Closet, A Young Man's Struggle with Faith and Sexuality. Where can people find that? That is at gotwords.org. And the book is also on um, Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Oh, good. All right. Those are easy to get to. And where can they find you, Larry, Where can if they want to hear more from you? They can, um, my contact information is on the website, but they can email me at L.A. Jameson, J-A-M-I-S-O-N, at gotwords.org. And let me tell you, I'm willing to talk to anybody. I'll talk to you on the phone or email, um, and you'll get my honest, unbiased viewpoint. It's really true. I find you to be one of, and I've felt this way since I met you, very authentic, very gentle. You know, um, like I, in my stuff, I have to be honest, I'm kind of angry about certain things. So my anger shows Mm -hmm. and I'm swearing Mm -hmm. and, you know, and you're just like, you know, (laughs) you're just, and people I think can hear evenness better than they can hearing my reactivity, but it's, it's the same. It's the message is, you know, uh, you're really saying to people, trust yourself. Yeah, you listen to your pastor, listen to your religion, listen to your family, yeah. whatever. But then come back to you and what is right for you. Who are you separate from what people yeah. want you to be? Right. And 
and look at both sides, research both sides. Don't be afraid yeah. to look at the voice that's saying something different yep. and than you, what you want to hear. Exactly. And you are very accessible, and I want people to hear that. So I hope they do contact you. And I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much, Larry. Oh, thank you, Joe. You're wonderful, and thanks for all that you do. And I find you equally as authentic and just so compassionate. So I'm just glad you're in my life, too. Thank you so much. All right. See you. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smart Sex, Smart Love. I'm Dr. Joe Court, and you can find me on joecourt.com. That's J-O-E-K-O-R-T.com. See you next time.